Nike's been losing ground in their running shoe market share over the last few years, and a lot of people speculate it's from all the new running shoe brands popping up over the last 10 years, like Hoka, On, Lululemon, Ultra, and even resurgence of brands that have been time-honored and old-school brands like Saucony, Brooks, Asics, and New Balance. So we're gonna cut these things in half, run them through our test, really try to figure out why Nike is losing such a huge part of their market share, especially in such a lucrative part of the industry with the running shoes, and why some of these other brands seem to be doing better and gobbling up any extra market share that Nike's leaving behind. And Nike losing part of the running shoe market share is not a small deal, because if you didn't know, Nike built basically built their entire brand from day one off running shoes with some of the innovations that really put them on the map. And so Colin's gonna explain the interesting history of Nike running, so you have the full context of why this matters so much for Nike. Running is in Nike's DNA. It was founded by two runners, Bill Bowerman and Phil Knight. Um, in 1964, they go in on a business together called Blue Ribbon Sports, where they distribute Onitsuka Tiger shoes through the United States, ASICS. By 1972, their relationship with Onitsuka Tiger breaks down and they found what we know as Nike today. In the 70s, they were originally innovating um, in their outsoles, where they were creating what they called waffle soles, which were inspired by Bill's wife's waffle iron. They were the first of its kind rubber tread that had a lug that was supposed to mimic the grip of a track spike, but for the road. Then by the time 1978 rolls around, they're innovating further and they cross paths with Frank Rudy and they purchased their Nike Air technology from him. And in 1979, they released the Air Tailwind, which is the first running shoe ever to have Nike Air. And they're pushing it even further. By the time we get to 1987, we have the Air Max One, which is the first running shoe to have visible air. Um, and so consumers can finally see through and see what Nike Nike Air is all about. And it didn't stop there. Uh, they innovated further and by the 90s, we're getting Nike Air Zoom, uh, which is our favorite airbag technology on the channel. And it's even utilized in this shoe, uh, the Nike Pegasus 41. Even though they're still using that technology, they've pushed it even further by 2016, 2017 in the Nike Vaporfly, they are inventing new categories. Nike invented the super shoe or super marathon racing shoe in the Nike Vaporfly. It's the first shoe to have a full length carbon fiber plate and giant stacks of super responsive, really cushy foams. It basically set up the mold for everyone else to copy over the last few years. Um, so it's interesting to see that Nike is losing market share to the people that are copying the format that they created. So what is this shoe? Well, the brand is Nike. The style is the Pegasus 41. They weigh 10 ounces. They retail for $140 and they're made in Indonesia. And the way that Nike positions this is responsive cushioning in the Pegasus provides an energized ride for everyday road running. Experience lighter weight energy return with dual air zoom units and a React X foam midsole. Plus improved engineering mesh of the upper, decreased weight and increased breathability. If you want a pair of these, check them out via links in my description. Which Rose Anvil wallet is right for you? If you're looking for a wallet you can go on a journey with, big enough to hold small notebooks, cash, passports, or boarding passes, and something you can throw in your bag and still fit in your pocket, you need the travel wallet. Let's look at wallet thickness and number of pockets. Here's how the travel stacks up. The travel wallet may not have the most pockets, it has five of them, and it may not be the thickest at 8.4 millimeters, but it's definitely the biggest. Closed, it's 4.25 by 5.75 inches, and open, it's 8.75 by 5.75 inches and it's hand stitching and full grain leather make it extra durable and everything you could need in a wallet. Check out the travel wallet and all of our other wallets at rosanville.com. So now I'll start going through the materials and seeing what's all just BS, what's work, what doesn't work, try to figure out why nobody's buying Nike running shoes anymore because the main things that we're actually gonna be looking for in this running shoe series, because we're gonna cut apart some of those competitors that seem to be eating up some of the market share. So we're gonna be testing breathability for obvious reasons, weight for obvious reasons, the amount of foams in the measurements so you know exactly what you're buying underfoot, the responsiveness of that foam, and just the internal tech that really helps give runners mechanical advantage during running, and one of the strongest selling points for any kind of footwear, but especially performance footwear in the running shoe industry. And that to me is the most exciting and funnest part because it's so interesting trying to suss out what's just all BS marketing and what's actual advantage and what's actually tech that improves the shoe and makes it a better running shoe. So we start looking at the materials with the upper first. They say it's upgraded breathable engineered mesh upper. 
And they don't really say much more than that because they don't know, they don't say what the mesh is made out of. So we burned it to see what it smells like and it, it like kind of melted and smelled like plastic. So it's probably nylon or some sort of synthetic material. But that's what drives me nuts about Nike and some of these big brands. They don't even tell you what you're buying. They, in the description, it's a bare bones description. And they, don't, and they don't give you any of the relevant information you might want as a running uh, hobbyist to know what you're actually getting. So we can at least test like the breathability and some of the other performance. So we put the breathability test on it. And as you can see, it, it's very breathable. You know, even though it has a lining on the inside, it's still surprisingly breathable. Puncture test took 43 pounds, but obviously it's, you know, these are not made to be punctured, but it's just a piece of information. And talking about that lining, this is a spacer mesh lining. You know, and what that means is you've got this outer black layer and this pink you see popping through. It's actually like two layers with a bunch of filaments structuring it. So it has a little bit of squish to it that's similar to foam, but without the heaviness and the, the, the closed cells of foam that doesn't allow it to breathe. But what does that actually do for a running shoe? Let's ask Colin since it's more his expertise and he runs and he knows a lot more about this kind of stuff. One of the reasons why you might use a spacer mesh textile on a running shoe is mostly breathability. Uh, for its weight and for how much coverage you get, it's actually very breathable and it's super lightweight as well. Because it's dimensional too, you get a bit of comfort. And so I can imagine if you're lacing those shoes up real tight, it can probably alleviate a little bit of lace pressure on your shoes. It's super important to get blood flow through the top of your foot while you're running. If you cut it off, you can be really uncomfortable for a while. I think also this shoe has a engineered mesh over top and it has pretty big holes through it. If you didn't have anything underneath, it wouldn't be as durable. Having an extra layer of spacer mesh on this shoe just makes it that bit more durable. But at the end of the day, it's still surprisingly bulky for a running shoe. And it's it, for me, I don't really need any of those attributes that seem to be, that seem to come from spacer mesh in a running shoe. And even comparing it to the other shoes in the series, a lot of them are a lot more simple construction of the upper. So not terrible by any means, but still surprised me that there's so much material around your foot for a running shoe. If we look deeper inside the shoe with the insole, this is just a typical open cell foam. It does have a little extra rebound and squish more similar to a closed cell foam than most open cell foam insoles we see. But you know, it's nothing special. There's no like crazy tech to this. It's just a basic insole. On the inside, you have a uh, strobel board that like, seems like it's a little bit of a pour on style foam, a little closed cell foam. And so once again, really nothing special or innovative in any way. And I can't even really feel the air units underneath. I don't feel those. So we'll see when we get it cut in half, if it actually does have two air units and where, there's, where they're put in the shoe. And we'll see if it actually adds anything to the performance of the shoe. And so we did do the ball drop test and it bounced up 11.8 inches right in the middle. And so it does seem like it is somewhat responsive. And if we start looking at that midsole, this is really with these running shoes where the meat of the shoe is. You know, this is where the important aspects are for running shoes. The upper and all these different things don't matter as much as what you're actually running on. But like I mentioned, it says they have the dual air zoom units because allegedly they're in the forefoot and in the heel. And I'm wondering if that's part of why people just are losing interest in Nike. Because even for me, like I was like, haven't we already done like the React X foam and Zoom Air? We've done versions of Air units and different X foams and all this reactive stuff. And it's like, a, to me, it kind of seems like from the outward appearance, Nike lacks innovation. You know, I, I still think they are innovating. They're doing some crazy stuff. But from the outside, a general consumer's perspective, when you, all you see is like air unit, X foam, and this, so it's like you're just seeing the same words over and over and over. So I'm wondering if there's some consumer fatigue with the lack of innovation from Nike. Meanwhile, all these other brands are like, we're doing this, this, and this, and putting plates in here and this, and then we spray on the upper, like that one on video. Like they're doing things that are actually new and different, whereas Nike seems to just be slightly re-innovating old technology. But that's just my opinion from an outsider's perspective, even though we're in the shoe industry, I'm not a a big runner and I don't pay attention to every single tech that Nike does. So, but what does Colin think of this? My opinion on this is hard to say. Um, I think the Pegasus is the wrong shoe to look at to understand this. Um, I will say like, I, I think Nike has lost favor in the market just because they aren't engaging communities in a new and meaningful way like these other brands are. I think all the innovation that's happening in these other brands is off of the back of Nike. And, you know, all of the racing innovation, the carbon plates, the foams, it was all started by Nike. Uh, they basically invented the category of super shoes where everyone is putting their technology and money in right now. The other brands are doing a good job of engaging communities and listening to user feedback. And I think Nike has just lost that a bit. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason why they're 
losing favor. I also do believe that they're not innovating as much as they could, even though other brands are piggybacking off of the movement that they created. Um, Nike hasn't done a lot of work to to keep the momentum going. I understand Weston's perspective that it it does really feel like, you know, we're rehashing the same old things. You're still using zoom units, you're still using air, like all this stuff is, you know, 30 years old, 20 years old, and you're just, you're adding an X here and you're doing this here. For the Pegasus, uh, for a product line where you have razor thin margins and you're trying to keep things just consistent and not new and exciting, but consistent, it's just not where you know, the new exciting stuff happens. Uh, and I think that's spread a little bit too much to the parts of Nike uh, that need a little bit of fun and exciting and new. And regardless, you know, even though these X foam with Zoom X, React X and all these different things, that doesn't mean they're not performance shoes or performance foam because we've seen with the Zoom X foam, it's been really, really good in the Invincible Run 2s, the Jordan 39s, it's responsive, it's ridiculously soft. So it is a performance uh, foam and even Nike says that the React X foam is 13% more responsive than previous React foams. And that's backed up by the bar drop test because it bounced up eight inches and it's tied for number nine overall of all tests that we've done. So it clearly is a responsive foam. And it's a super soft foam at like 12 to 15 Shore A. And the interesting thing with this, it kind of reinforces what, I've, what I'm feeling from Nike about them just caring about all the wrong stuff is the biggest part of their description for this shoe in their product listing is this. It says crafted for performance and planet. React X foam is engineered to reduce its carbon footprint by at least 43%. And it kind of goes on about some other stuff. And then it says other midsole components such as airbags, plates, and other foam formations were not considered. And so I was like, the biggest part was like, we're sustainable, we're this, this, and this, but also you're Nike. And it's like, we all know the, the story of Nike. And also to like kind of twist the truth and be like, how do we how do we selectively say 43% instead of like 30%? Well, let's exclude the air units from that claim. Let's exclude any plates or any rubber, any other kind of things that aren't the specific foam that we can claim as 43% more sustainable. Like that's, I think that to me is why I don't really believe Nike half the time they do anything. Cause it's not that running people don't care about sustainability and that you shouldn't care about sustainability and better made products that are better for the environment, all that stuff. But it just seems like Nike is starting to care more about the brand and the perception of the Nike brand more than the actual performance of the product they sell. But that's just my opinion from the outside. So let's cut them in half, see where those air units are, see what's on the inside, the different measurements and see if there's anything innovative about the shoe at all. Okay, we got them cut in half, and if you're not subscribed, just push the little button. It helps us out more than you can imagine. We're almost two million subscribers, and we got some wacky and really cool stuff planned for when we hit that million subscriber mark. So help us get there. So let's see what's inside. So fortunately there is actually two air units in there. Not that I expected Nike to not put two in there, but sometimes they just are really tricky about the placement and the size to just do enough to say they have certain tech when in all reality it's not in there. But this seems to be well placed. It seems like it's intentional and, and you can feel it underfoot. You can feel that how dead normal like zoom foam feels and like those runners that we did previously compared to having a couple air units in there. You do feel that responsiveness. But other than that, that's pretty simple. You know, it's just that foam all the way through. And here's your measurements that I think are valuable for everyone that's in, actually into running that these brands don't put on their website. The heel height, the toe height, the lasting material and the, the specs of the insole, the rubber outsole and its specs. And we'll slowly gather all this information, put it all on screen as we go through this series. And we'll do a final wrap up video. So you have every piece of information and final results. Cause I'm, I'm still learning as we go. Like I, you know, every time we do one of these videos, I learn more and more. So now then why is Nike losing market share? Well, to me, part of it's just old tech. Even though it is new tech, it's a slight, slight variation on old tech. It's still just air units and like Zoom foam and X foam. It does. It just doesn't. It doesn't excite me in any way. It's not what the other brands are doing by introducing a lot of really interesting angles on things and new concepts and new foams and new materials. 
it's just very standard for Nike. The biggest takeaway for me from this video is it seems like I get this feeling that Nike cares way more about the Nike brand and how the Nike brand is perceived and its cultural significance and it's, it's and what the brand Nike means, just do it, all this stuff and they're forgetting about the actual product. It seems like they care way more about the Nike brand than the actual product that Nike is selling. And I think people are catching on. And I think I think people are starting to feel that, they're starting to notice that. And with all the new competition, they're doing what Nike should have been doing. And I think that's opened up that gap between Nike and these other brands that they've been able to fill in and start capturing some of that market share. Because that's exactly what those new brands have to do. In order to break into the market, you can't do the same thing Nike's doing. You can't do the same thing Adidas and all these big brands are doing. You have to do something new. You have to do something innovative. You have to change the game so much that people are like, oh, I've got to go with the new brand. I can't, I'm not going with the trusted brand, I'm going with the new brand. And that seems to be what all the new brands are doing. Meanwhile, Nike seems to have their head in the clouds. But that's just my opinion. So what's Colin's opinion on why Nike is losing market share? My opinion on why Nike's losing market share is a little bit more nuanced and different. Essentially, I just think Nike has failed to really engage with the communities who use their product. And I think they just seem like they're behind. If you look at, like we're looking at the Pegasus, if you look at all of the same price point daily trainers across the board from everybody, um, and you looked at just materials and construction, like they're all gonna feel pretty much the same. I think what excites other people about these other brands is like their feedback, I think gets taken into account. I don't know that a lot of feedback goes into Nike and comes out with a new product. It's, it's hard to say. Uh, because with a product line like the Pegasus, for example, like it's a well-oiled machine at this point and it just churns them out. It's not the space where innovation is happening. Um, and even though the racing stuff uh, where Nike has, you know, kind of created this whole new category, everyone's caught up and everyone has a carbon plated racer um, and they're doing things different that the community wanted. And what's hard is, you know, Nike has always been an innovation company. Um, and I think just with the leadership of John Donahoe being someone who's really focused on like direct to consumer marketing um, and direct to consumer purchasing and sales, um, he doesn't have that innovation mindset. He doesn't have that innovation background. And so not a lot of energy and time is being spent there. Um, I think in a few years, you'll probably see something really crazy, really cool from Nike, but I think it's just been a quite a few years coming out of COVID for them of uh, kind of sitting on their laurels, not trying to keep up with the market and just hang back. So let me know what you guys think, because this is the first of this whole series. So let me know what else you want us to cover and what other brands you want us to cover and why you think things are shaping out the way are, they are with Nike and why they're losing market share. Thanks for all you guys' support and watching these videos. Let me know what else you want to see. And thank you guys. See ya.